I'm Sue Rowley, and I'm a curator here at the Museum of Anthropology. And today I'm really excited, and I'm glad you're coming on the journey with us. We're about to have a new piece join the collection, a new uh, Salish weaving by weaver Barbara Marks McCoy, generously donated by the family of Susan, the late Susan Root, who was a volunteer here at the museum for many years. So I just wanted to give you a little sense of what you're going to see today and the history of why this weaving is so important. This piece here that we've pulled out for you to see is by Barbara Marks McCoy. It is a contemporary weaving, but it shows you some of the amazing patterns that were used by weavers prior to the arrival of Europeans. Of course, this one is done out of sheep's wool, and the earlier weavings were done out of mountain goat wool and the hair of a small breed of dog that was specially raised and cared for uh, by the women to be able to use their hair for weaving. This is an example of an earlier weaving. This one is done in a style of work called twill work, and I especially wanted to bring this one up because sometimes we get the question of what happened to weaving? Did it disappear? Why do people talk about contemporary weavings as being a revitalization or a bringing back of an ancient weaving form? And the reason is colonization. And in fact, what is amazing is that the knowledge was continued despite all the things that worked against the ongoing work by women to weave. This is an early weaving. It actually comes from one of the old hop farms. It has mountain goat wool in it. But can you see these strips of color in it? These are actually from introduced fabrics from European trade cloth. And so, of course, one of the things that happened when Europeans arrived was trade through the Hudson's Bay Company brought Hudson's Bay Company blankets. And so being able to go into the trading post and trade for blankets, as opposed to having to gather all the raw materials, all the dye materials, uh, do all the weaving, you can imagine that there was an interest in uh, introduced blankets. But of course, before the blankets, the introduction of European blankets, there were introduced diseases. And those worked to break the transmission of knowledge from one generation to the next. So you have particularly introduced diseases take out the very, very young and the very, very old. And of course, that transmission of knowledge from the elders to the young becomes, begins to break down. Then you have, on top of that, the addition of the reservation system where people are told where they can and cannot live. And all of a sudden, the ability to keep your small dogs on islands, away from the community for their gathering their hair, or to go up into the mountains to go mountain goat hunting to collect the goat hairs, becomes something that you're not able to do. Also, regulations for fishing meant that going out and getting the fish that you needed to feed your dogs becomes also a problem. When Musqueam weavers, through Wendy Grant, John at Musqueam, and others, began to bring back, revitalize, reawaken weaving in the 1980s, they were able to turn to some of the older community members for information about them. And what we see here, and we'll be seeing later, is this remarkable pattern here, which Barbara Marks McCoy looked at in a book so that's a little bit about what we're going to be seeing and learning about today. Hey, Shep, that weaving I was telling you about has arrived. Oh, that's great. It's by uh, Barbara Marks, who's also Barbara Marks McCoy and Barb Caillou. And she was one of the first group of Musqueam weavers who started in 1984. And I always remember Deborah Sparrow saying to me that Barb is an amazing weaver. She currently lives down stateside because she was the first one that figured out how to do these very sharp zigzags. And then the, the base here, she's actually taking off on the idea of some of the early cedar bark cakes that had this slightly oh, yeah. rounded base to them. So this is probably one of her early pieces because this was collected by um, one of our volunteers, a number of our volunteers at the time when Musqueam Weaving first started, actually purchased pieces from the weavers. This is the uh, daughter of the volunteer who found this in their family collection and thought the museum would be a nice place for it to come to. When the Musqueam Weavers started in 1984, one of the few reference books they had to see the ancient weavings that were in museums in Europe and Eastern North America was Salish Weaving by Paul Augustuson. 
And one of the great things that we have is this uh, exhibit that was done here at the museum many years ago called Hands of Our Ancestors uh, that Betsy Johnson and Kitty Burnick worked on. And here you can see this is Barb at the loom. And you can see her weaving these very sharp Vs. I'm Nancy Brugman. I'm the MOA Collections Manager. I started working at MOA in the Collections Department in 1995, and I've been the Collections Manager since 2002. Um, I do some of the most important work on managing the collections, but it's not very exciting to talk about. But, in fact, if I didn't do this sort of thing, no one would be able to find anything in the collection and you wouldn't be able to look anything up and you wouldn't know who gave you anything or how to find it. The first thing I need to get is the documentation telling me that we own the object. So once we own the object, then we start a process where things get registered both on paper and hard copy files and digitally. So I can show you, we're still using the rather antiquated system for the basic registration and some of the old ledgers go back to the very very founding collection the Burnett collection and they're in terrible shape because they've been around so long but just to let you know this is the only way they were registered in the beginning was in these books because of course there weren't any computers so we're still doing just a very basic entry in the ledgers just to keep track of each different accession group that comes in. This is where their numbers are assigned that will stay with them forever. So I've got the donor, the donor's email originally that came in saying I have this weaving, would you like to have it in the museum? Which then I forwarded to Sue to see, put her in touch with the donor. And then I create the file that has all these pertinent bits of information in it, including the things from the acquisitions committee. And the donor in this case happened to also send us a nice picture. So I have a picture now that we're sometimes working remotely, which really helps. So then what I would do is enter it into the database with its new number. Just so happens that this donor is related to another donor in our database. Her mother used to be a volunteer here, so I know that some of the family is already in our database. And her grandfather was actually the third president of UBC. He's in our database too. Pretty normal that if somebody asks me if somebody's in the database, I will have either heard of them or not heard of them. So we'll just enter a little bit of identification information here that off the top of my head. For the rest of its life at the museum, someone will always be able to figure out when this object came in, who it came from, where it's from, any history we know about it. And this will all be recorded digitally, which is also backed up and available online. But we'll also keep these files, as you can see, over in the lab here, we have a massive bank. All of these are full of the primary documentation for all the objects in the collection. My name is Shabnam Hanarbakhsh. I'm collections coordinator here at MOA. My day-to-day -day work focuses on collections care and preventative conservation for MOA collections objects. This room known as Dirty Room because it is the first entry point of any object to museum space. Dirty means any possibility of hidden insect or infestation within an object. This room is a critical part of our uh, integrated pest management program that is in place to prevent infestation within a museum, all by non-chemical means. So one of the method that we use here is low temperature freezing objects. So in this case, our object is a weaving textile that's suitable for freezer. So I'm going to wrap this one and make it ready for freezing. We wrap objects with tissue paper before seal it in plastic polyethylene bag because if in any case condensation happens, we want the tissue paper to absorb any damp and water. Now this object is ready for the next load of the freezer.
Today I'm opening the freezer to take objects out uh, after 14 days. The temperature right now is minus 33. We need to leave objects wrapped for 24 hours to defrost and get to the room temperature. And here is the ethnographic lab that the next process of the clean and insect-free object will start here. I'm Kate Pilon. I'm one of the collections coordinators here at MOA. Um, one of the things that I do is I accession all of the new acquisitions that come into the collections. One of the things that we do when we're accessioning objects is we're adding all of the basic information to the database, so such as the measurements. When we're accessioning an object into the collection, we want to make sure that it's searchable, so we're being consistent. We're using the common terminology, just so that someone could actually be able to link certain objects in the database. Anything that we get provided in the record, we're going to add to the database, so it'll be like artist, culture, location that it was made, location that it was used. Um, but then we're also doing basic things like colors, materials. Um, we use a very specific nomenclature. So when you're entering wool, you'd actually be going to fiber, and it'd be wool fiber. So another thing that's really important to do is when we first receive objects into the collection is to note their condition. We've got the looped knot in the proper right corner. And we always make sure that we have the tag with the barcode and then it will go on to the next step of numbering. My name is Caitlin Chamberlain. I'm the collections assistant in the collections and conservation department. So when it comes to numbering objects, we have a few different methods for, depends on the material. So for a textile, instead of gluing it directly onto the textile, we glue it onto an archival material called Tyvek. And then what we do is that we sew it onto the, well, it depends on the textile. For this one, I'm going to sew it on the back in the bottom right corner. The point of numbering is to, first of all, keep track of the object, but also we want it to be as hidden as possible so that it isn't obvious to guess because it can be very distracting if visitors see it in the galleries. The important thing when numbering the textile is you don't sew through the material. Uh, what I'm going to do is sew through the fiber. I don't want to puncture the fabric in any way. I want to work with what's already there. Three knots, just to make sure. And then I cut off the excess. And it is numbered. My name is Alina Eliasova. I'm the digital imager here at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. I digitize objects that are either donated to the museum or strategically acquired. I also do photography for the MOA publications. It can be either books or museum notes that accompany exhibits, and those are really interesting. It's at this point, Caitlin and I are going to place the weaving on the seamless. Just going to make it nice and even on the fringe here. The goal is to create very even lighting without any shadows. Not that you would have many shadows with a textile would be more relevant to a 3D object. Right now I'm going to level the camera and at MOA we use the Hasselblad H6D with the 50 megapixel back which gives incredible details and that's to ensure that people who are doing research on these objects have the ability to zoom in as much as possible and in this case see the weave There we go. So we don't include the entire color checker, we only include the first two rows. And also for objects that require multiple images, 
For this one, we're just going to do front and back, and they are the same. I'm going to indicate what this shot is. So I scan the barcode, and I'm going to say that this is side one. And so when the image travels down the line, and when it ends up on the mocap, people know what, what they're looking at. This is my favorite space because you walk in here and you know things are happy. It feels good. And it is a very huge privilege to have this kind of a space and be able to care for the things in this space. My name is Heidi Swearinga, and I'm one of the conservators here at the Museum of Anthropology. The space that we're in right now is our textile storage room. And this is one of our three major storage rooms within the institution. Where we were before, which was, um, and this is before our renovations, so more than 10 years ago, um, was a retrofitted photo studio. And when you walked into that space, it was dark, it was uh, gray, it was difficult to see things, but people had done a really good job with the space that it was. And we ended up with lots of different storage solutions for textiles materials but they're really hard to get at. All of the textiles were difficult to get at. So when you come in here, you have visibility. Everything is wide open because we want to see what we're doing. So we can see the dust. We can see any insect infestations that might be happening. But everything has its own home. It's either going to be on a roll or it's going to be on a tray. It might be in a box, but it's one object per space for the most part and they have a chance to breathe. They have a chance to rest. The, the units are broken up into, as best as possible, cultural groupings, and if not, then regional groupings. And we like to keep the materials together. They're not broken up so much into blankets and headdresses and different material types. It's hoping to get all of one item from one community together in the same location. This one is a perfect perfect size to go on a 4x4 four four tray. Each of these trays is lined with a non-woven material. This is a Holytex, and that's its lift support if we ever need to pick it up again. That's its barcode, and it's our tracking system. Shab is tracking in the location on the unit that correlates to the object number so that we can quickly retrieve things again. And I think one of the most favorite things that I have in this space is showing people the dust covers that we have. Our wonderful volunteer who works with us in conservation, is Judith Earl, took up the job of making these dust covers. I mean, they're perfect, a perfect solution, but if you look closely, you'll see that the, some of them are made up of numerous pieces of different materials. Because what she had done, because this is how wonderful she is, she used all the scrap pieces of fabric that we had, offcuts from different projects, sewed them all together like quilts, and then made the dust covers. So if you're wondering, people who like to work with collections, who like to work in the basement of the museum, actually engaging with the pieces, uh, different, different personality types, but I think by far it's people who love to spend their day looking at beautiful objects and people who have a high attention to detail, the minutia, somebody like our collections manager, Nancy, has a head for detail. Without that, uh, it would be a very challenging job. Hello everyone. Um, I really hope you enjoyed that little documentary we made. 
Thank you to everyone involved in making it. You all allowed Rhea and I and your peaceful workspace with our cameras and questions. Um, so uh, hopefully it was worth it. Um, and thank you, Rhea, our public programming intern. You did an amazing job on this project. Uh, the Museum of Anthropology is an institution of learning. We are part of the University of British Columbia and every year we have the opportunity to employ interns um, to work alongside faculty and volunteers. Our interns bring inspiration and valuable specialty knowledge throughout most of our departments. And in many ways, the museum is, uh, is uh, fueled by this perpetual fountain of youth and it contributes greatly to all of our work. Um, this year was special because of COVID. Restrictions gave us opportunities to focus on media production in a way that public programming hasn't in the past. Uh, this in turn allowed me to look for a student who is equally passionate about media and filmmaking as I am. Rhea and I have uh, already worked on a few successful programs and now we're getting further and further into authentic documentary filmmaking. Um, this is my favorite, um, one of my favorite things about documentary filmmaking is that we don't go into a project with answers, but instead we, uh, we come with questions and curiosity. So um, just like everybody else on the planet, the museum has had to look at itself from a new perspective. And in, uh, in, the, in doing this, uh, we become the subjects ourselves. Um, so more and more, we are documenting what goes on inside of MOA, who works here, how we work together, and how we engage with community through our work. So Ria, uh, I'd like to start with you uh, with a few questions. So um, first, uh, where are you from? And how did you wind up in Vancouver? I'm learning how to best answer that question, honestly, so I'm glad you asked. Um, I'm from India. My parents have raised me Indian. Um, they're from New Delhi, so I guess I'm from New Delhi as well. Um, but I've been living in different countries my whole life, um, so it's kind of hard to answer this question. Um, the last place I lived in before Vancouver was Bangkok, Thailand, um, and that's where I graduated high school from. And then I came to Vancouver to study film here um, at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. And um, now that I have a bachelor's in film, I just decided I wanted to stay here. And that's how I ended up here at the museum. And I'm very excited to be learning some new skills as MOA's public programs intern. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of those new skills? Um, I think the main skill I'm learning to is just like to let things be when I'm filming. I think one big difference between narrative based films and documentary um, is the script. I've been trained in like narrative filmmaking mostly at Emily Carr. Um, and a script means that you have control over the narrative or the characters or the picture you're trying to paint basically. But in documentary, you don't get that. You don't get that control. Um, so I'm just learning how to let things be and just be as present as possible when filming and get as much as I can. Um, and it's honestly making my editing a lot stronger. Um, like it's helping me gain an intuition as to like where to cut or where to leave pauses in between, like when I'm editing stuff. Um, yeah, I think it's, I've definitely become a stronger editor than I was um, like since I started here. Yeah. That's great to hear because you were already a really strong editor. That, <laughs> that was your thing. Cool. Very cool. Um, okay. So last question. Do you think um, this has changed your practice in a way that you might take on, like how might it skew the direction you go in the future, if at all? Um, I think I was mostly only making films that revolved around a script, um, as I've mentioned. And like, I mean, I've been doing scripted films since I was like 10 years old, technically, with my little sister. Um, and I think already I'm doing a lot of documentary films in my own time, um, thanks to MOA, um, and just becoming a stronger editor. Editing is like a big, big passion of mine. It's just it's my favorite aspect of filmmaking. Um, and I really think documentary is just so vast. There's so many different ways to tell one story. I think that like learning through respect, learning through documentary as respectfully and honestly as possible to honor the story is definitely something I want to take with me moving forward. Yeah. Great. That's yeah. great. Well, you did an incredible job. And 
so for everybody else in the audience who doesn't know, this will be a continued series and we're going to be looking into a lot of different aspects of the museum. So stay tuned for those. Um, and next, I'm going to move on to Shabnam, our collections coordinator, somebody who was very enthusiastic about this project. Uh, you were the first person at the museum to respond with this enthusiasm, specifically for the documentary process. You jumped on the opportunity to show the world what we do behind the scenes. Uh, you helped to produce this program uh, because um, as your enthusiasm grew, so too did the involvement of others. So uh, it opened up doors for us to peek inside the world of collections and conservation and um, share it with our guests tonight. So um, same question for you to start off with. Uh, where are you from and how did you wind up working at MOA? Thanks, Mary. Um... I'm from Iran and uh, I moved to Canada right after I finished my graduate school. And uh, as my first job, I was working in Canada for a private collector, uh, managing a small collections. And short after that, I was fortunate to be part of uh, MOA, to join MOA as part of Renewal Project, a collection research enhancement project as a MOVE technician. And since it was 2006, and since then, I am with MOA in different position within the collections care management and conservation. And uh, here I'm, I am today with you. And I'm so happy that I could uh, be part of this, your, uh, your new series and uh, make this happen. And thank you all for uh, this opportunity. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit more, because we weren't able to make a, a, a long documentary and we've got to do this in pieces. Tell us a little bit more about the different processes used to ensure that an object is safe to bring into the collections. For example, what materials can't be frozen or what would you do with a drum that had a stretched hide or paint flaking off of it? Uh, examination and treatment is the first step of the IPM integrated pest management program here at MOA. Each object, as soon as it arrived, uh, it's been examined and tested and make sure that uh, the condition of the object. Uh, the treatment, there are two, three different ways. Uh, the first and uh, most common one is the freezing, low temperature, as you saw in this documentary. Uh, which is exposing object to um, minus 21st degree centigrade at least for 14 days. CCI recommend minimum of 72 hours. But for some object, for instance, like a uh, rubber, a shell, uh, a stretch hide, or even uh, acrylic on canvas, that uh, they're not uh, withstand the low temperature. Uh, we do uh, anoxia process, which is uh, putting the object in the seal environment with low oxygen. Um, and even if sometimes that uh, treatment is not possible due to the size or uh, sometimes the condition of objects, then uh, we just simply uh, seal object in a plastic clear bag and monitor for any insect activities. Um, there are like three way for IPM project. Nice. Like uh, you asked for the drum, mm -hmm. uh, the drum because it does have the stretch uh, height and then definitely not freezing. And then we would do an oxia treatment for that. Right, right. So we might show that in another uh, part of the series later on because we've got some upcoming shows. Um, and there's constantly different types of objects moving through your space. <laughs> Every time I walk down there, I see something different and I peek in. Um, so what would you do if, um, what would you do if it was a, an object that had a live bug infestation? Uh, definitely seal it as soon as possible. <laughs> we don't want anything uh, spreading in our collections and definitely it's going to be in the room that I show you, my room, the dirty room. And uh, if 
possible freezing uh, is a first step and uh, detailed cleaning right after that to make sure that we get rid of any insect uh, and bugs or any infestation that it's within our object before uh, sending objects through the uh, collection. Right, right. So um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the, the other projects that you're working on now. I know that you've got some pretty incredible um, new objects that have come in that are quite unusual. Uh, yes, that's an interesting part of my job, that uh, an exciting part that to see different type of objects with material and sizes. Uh, one of the new acquisition uh, that new acquired here was uh, squid, the giant squid made of uh, drift net uh, as part of the ghost net project in Aruba. Hmm. And uh, we do have few different um, type of, of that type of object, but this one, it is about three meter long and uh, one meter in diameter. Uh, but uh, when I received the package, I was surprised to see the like medium sized cardboard box and didn't expect to receive that giant squid in that type of packaging. Uh, but it was all like, like a cardboard crunch together. Right, yeah. uh, and then, um, of course, it's like unpacking, reshaping this one, and um, same process, um, wrapping, freezer, and uh, but because due to its size and the weight and like handling was the challenge, uh, and digitization uh, wasn't possible in a normal setting. We have to create a stand and. Um, base for DG and also um, it doesn't fit in the our MVG cases. It has a, it does need a new um, or special arrangement with design and our design team is uh, going to do the make an installation but the mount making uh, we made a special mount for the hanging and um, it's going to be up on display in few months soon. That's great. That's great. And it will join a collection of other ghost net pieces that we already have. Yes, we have the hammerhead. The turtle and the whale. Yes. Yeah. Also, yes. Yeah. 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 It's, it's in the MVG and it's actually one of my favorite collections. It was brought in by curator Carol Mayer. Uh, Carol Mayer. Um, and uh, they're really intricate pieces. So um, if you're, if you're interested in conservation in terms of the environment and what some people are doing to draw awareness, um, that's a great place to start. We've got a hammerhead shark. We've got some jellyfish. We've got a sea turtle, <laughs> sea turtle. And yes, um, this, uh, this new piece is quite large. So I'm excited to see where it's gonna go. Um, so let's see, um, I guess maybe Nancy, we've got a question from the audience. So I'm gonna move on to you. And um, just to remind everybody in the audience, if you do have questions, please pop them into the comments um, and this chat section and send them our way and we'll just weave them in to our conversation. So uh, Nancy, uh, how far back to the books um, do the records, the record books go? Uh, will it be interesting? It'll be interesting to know the date of the first collection. Uh, well, that's not completely straightforward because uh, the first what we call our founding collection is the Burnett Collection actually was given to UBC in 1927. So the museum didn't exist until 1949. So there were some other collections that came in before the museum actually existed. And I know uh, like one of the basketry collections ended up over in the geology department and then was later transferred over to MOA once MOA existed. So you could say 1927, you could say 1949. It depends how you want to call it. <laughs> right, right. Um, 
All right. Well, uh, so just to give people a little background um, on Nancy or just a little bit of a word about what she does here, she is integral to the process of pretty much all the workings of the museum. She quietly works away in the basement, um, but it's her attention to detail and extensive knowledge of the MOA collection that makes her an asset um, to the museum. Um, her, she's a bit of a centrifuge. Uh, she, everything from, you know, collecting information to cataloging and just her, her vast um, knowledge and historical knowledge of the museum because she's been here for as long as she has makes her a database in, of her own. Um, so many things don't even translate into the work that she does. So um, I do wanna ask you the first question because I always love to know where people are from. We do have a, a pretty interesting cast of characters here. So where are you from? Uh, what did you study and how long have you been at the museum? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I grew up in Ontario, like so many in Vancouver, but um, I've moved here across the country to stop in the Rockies for a while and then ended up here in the 80s. Um, but I then went to UBC in 1990 and when I graduated, well, actually in my last year, I heard about this incredible course um, where you could actually do hands-on work in the museum and somebody told me it was their favorite course during their entire four years. So I decided to take museum studies. And once I was exposed to um, the collections work that went on, it was, I guess you could say, like a love at first sight. Um, <laughs> I was made for that and it was made for me, one might say. I have that, like everyone jokes about my attention to detail, but it is, um, I can remember things that go back many, many years and <laughs> all the numbers and things. Um, so I'm a bit unusual these days, I think, in that I worked my way up from being an unpaid volunteer to a paid um, short term and then into collections assistant and then collections assistant manager and then acting collections manager and then collections manager and still here and I guess I'm in 25 years now. So yep. almost a dinosaur. <laughs> wow. Um, all right, so then you'll be able to answer this really easily. Uh, where does most of our collection come from? Uh, yeah, so we're actually getting closer to a tipping point. I know the whole time that I've been at MOA, our largest collection has always been from Asia, which surprises a lot of people. They assume it's North American. Um, and I know when I, most of the years I've been here, it's been at least 40% of the collection and maybe a bit more. But I noticed the last time I did the numbers on this, uh, the director asked me for these just a while ago. Um, we're actually reaching the point where North America is creeping up there. So Asia is only 33% now and North America is up to 32. So it's getting to be, you know, and so that's most of the collection, but we do have things from all over the world, you know, all of every continent and many of the islands. Yeah. yeah. As you walk around, you can really see that. Um, so um, how many do we get a year? How many new acquisitions do we get a year? Uh, yeah, and that has ranged wildly over the years. Um, I do, I keep a running tab of the averages all the time. And at the moment we're at about 1200 a year average in the last 10 years. But when you look, it's been as low as 100 a year some years and as high a few years ago as um, 20, over 2,600 in one year, um, which I know is, is not a lot compared to some big museums, but it keeps us more than busy. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so uh, I know that many of these items are available online. And that's, again, one of the reasons why um, MOA is considered an educational institution, first and foremost. So um, how do we access these items online, these objects online? So um, we've actually, one little tidbit that a lot of people probably don't know is that 
Um, I wasn't around way back then, but I've been told that we were the first institution in Canada to actually put our records into an electronic database. And that was actually way back in the mid seventies. And we've had one running ever since. And so um, about 10 years ago or so, we finally made our own um, online catalog and we had it purposely built. And so anything pretty much, as soon as objects are accessioned, as you see in our processing, once they reach the accession point, um, then I publish the records right away and then they get refreshed and you can find them in the online catalog. And uh, we also have another database that we created about the same time, uh, maybe a little earlier, called the Reciprocal Research Network. And we were the beta data <laughs> for that as well. So our whole collection is also in the Reciprocal Research Network where it's now um, joined in with, um, I don't know, 20 or 30 other institutions' data. data. Oh, wow. That's pretty impressive. Um, we've got one question from an audience member that I think is pretty interesting. Um, I'm, and she says, uh, or I think they say, I'm curious if MOA is incorporating traditional indigenous collections and care into conservation concepts on a daily practice. Well, that could be a complicated answer. Um, Open it up to see. see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> We do in a way, in certain ways, like we have um, some objects that are culturally sensitive. And if we have information about a better way to store them, um, certain wrappings, orientations, who should handle it, should it be on or off display, um, things like that, we certainly um, try to follow that as closely as, closely as we can. Uh, we also have a practice that has been actually going on at MOA since the 80s uh, for a long, long time of um, letting objects, um, people take objects back to the communities. Um, most people assume that's a fairly recent thing, but it has. there have actually been times when it happened way back in the 80s where we've um, let, uh, taken pieces back to potlatches for use or display. Um, a lot of uh, when the Musqueam weavings were coming into the collection, Musqueam would sometimes borrow them back in order to wear them uh, for events and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and they still do. Um, I was talking with Karen Dufek the other day about um, some of the objects that she does return. She goes to uh, Alert Bay um, mm -hmm. and, and, and brings back masks and um, regalia for certain ceremony that is still used with the Kukwakiwak people. Um, we've got another- I guess, oh, just one quick other thing. Um, I know that in conservation, Heidi also has brought in um, uh, indigenous makers to help with the conservation of certain pieces. And there's things like um, the New Chalmuth canoe that's normally in our great hall where the prow was broken off decades and decades ago. So uh, Karen uh, found a canoe maker on the West Coast to come and re recraft a prow and add it to the canoe forest, things like that. Right, right. Um, and back to a technical question for you. Uh, if someone is interested in donating an item, what is the process you go, to, go through um, for reviewing it um, and receiving the item? Does it start with a letter and a photo of the item detailing its history? Yeah. Um, usually these days it comes in as an email. Um, we're just in the process of changing the co-chairs of the acquisitions committee, but um, the, the email addresses are on our website and uh, the best thing right now would be to send it to Karen Dufik, because he's the co-chair of acquisitions. And uh, we then ask the um, potential donor for as much information as they have on the piece and um, photos if the piece was local in normal times, we would um, like to visit, you know, usually the curator would go see it in person, but of course during COVID, we're pretty much all using photographs right now. So uh, once we have all the information and photos, then it would come to the next acquisition committee meeting, which meets, we meet once a month. And then we will 
look at it for a number of reasons. The condition um, size actually has an is, is an issue sometimes, um, whether it's local or whether it requires shipping because shipping has become a very expensive um, problem these days. Uh, whether it enhances our collection or adds or strengthens it. Um, but one of the things like I know, say we have very, very, very many, um, say baskets that don't have very much provenance. So we're um, pickier about say what kind of things we might take now where we really are, would be looking for provenance for sure um, in order to take more of something that we already have a lot of. Right. And um, I did want to ask one last question um, that I think is a big one for many people out there, uh, just in the world in general. Um, so what impact has COVID-19 had from your perspective on museums when it comes to um, the career aspects of it? And um, how do you feel it's, it's changing those aspects today? Uh, yes, I, well, of course, in the museum community, I'm sure most people are aware that uh, we're, a lot of us are built on tourism. So MOA is um, in a good position right now being part of a university because we have some support behind us. But a lot of museums, the only money um, coming through the door is literally walking through the door. So. Um, as tourism has been booming and booming for years, uh, I think a lot of museums have been um, doing well with that, but now suddenly no, almost no tourists. Um, it's gonna hit a lot of people very hard, including us. And there's already been mass layoffs. So I know there are more and more people um, taking training in museum studies right now. And I know they, they could have a hard time, I think, finding a job until the tourism industry rebounds. And I don't know how long that will take. Well, that's up to us as a museum culture to figure out how to engage our local audiences <laughs> on a regular basis. That's how I'm taking it. Yeah. Uh, I did want to get back to one question that somebody asked about internships and how to find them and apply for them. We do post them on our website and we usually have them posted on uh, UBC job websites for students because we do usually prioritize UBC students. But in this particular case, uh, because we were looking for a specialty with Rhea, um, we did reach out to Emily Carr. Um, so yep, just check in with us every once in a while and see what we're up to. As Nancy said, it's a little bit harder these days because everything's kind of um, being a bit squeezed, but um, the show must go on. So we will be hiring throughout the years and we will be here, of course. Um, so I'm going to move on to Sue Rowley. Um, Sue, you are our curator, uh, you're a curator at MOA. You're the chair of MOA's rep um, repatriation committee, as well as being a faculty member in the Department of Anthropology and director of the Laboratory of Archaeology. Um, so you wear many hats at UBC. Uh, what life experience did you have that brought you here? It sounds like you had a lot. <laughs> okay, wow. Um, yeah, so I think I've always uh, loved playing in the dirt, hence archaeology. But more than that, I really love stories and histories and the way that material culture, heritage, people's belongings contain those stories, contains memory, contain history, and contain an amazing wealth of knowledge as we saw in that weaving. I mean, think about that weaving that talked about hunting, that talked about understanding plants and how you do dyeing and all those kinds of things. So I, I just, I, I really love uh, working with Indigenous communities to look at those and to try to answer questions with the heritage that is here in the building uh, that they have questions about. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and how did I get here? Let's see, I, I like Nancy, I'm an Ontario uh, person, um, born on the uh, lands of the Anishinaabe people. 
uh, and then I went off to university and I was very, very fortunate at a young age to spend time uh, up in the Arctic working with Inuit uh, communities and, and really listening to oral history. And so that again made the connection for me between the material culture isn't just things, yeah. they are people's belongings, they have memories attached to them and they tell, they tell these histories. So that sort of brought me around to working in museums. I did that as part of my PhD thesis and then continued on. Right, right. And um, how often do curators like yourself work with the collections care and management team? Um, as often as we can. They are really the backbone of the museum. Um, and I, I think that's one of the things that's so great about the film that you've just produced is it does really show uh, so many of the public think of the museums and they think of exhibits. And then if they think of anything with exhibits, they think of curators. And of course, Nancy Shab, everybody else that you showed in the film, we wouldn't be able to do any of the work that we do. There wouldn't be collections in this building without them. Yeah. So, so thank you for that. And so we get to work with them all the time. Whenever we're, for instance, uh, working on an idea, it's necessary to talk to everybody in collections. Does it fit into their timelines? Are the pieces that we're looking at uh, putting in the exhibit, are they ones that can go out? Do they have light level concerns? Are they culturally sensitive? These are all things that the collection staff are experts on and we turn to them all the time. Right, right. And um, what is the involvement of curators in the process of a piece entering MOA's collection from the ground up? So I, I'm, I'm sure it comes from many different directions, but in your experience, not only because you're a curator, but because you're also, you know, director of the, the LOA collection, like how does this normally work? And is there a plethora of different ways? There's, there's lots of different ways, but the system at, at MOA generally engages the curator really on in the process. Quite often we'll get someone who sends in a, something to Nancy or to uh, the MOA main general email or to our uh, library staff saying, I have something in my family that I think it would, MOA would be a good home for it. Mm -hmm. That always triggers an email to a curator. And then from there, the question about photographs, the conversation about where does it come from? What its history is it at? When did it come into the country if it's from outside? Which curator should be looking at it? And then it's the curator has to fill out what's called a consideration form, which then goes to the acquisitions committee that Nancy sits on. And the a curator like myself will actually have to explain why uh, I think this piece is uh should be coming into the collection or why i think it's it's not a good fit for us and then of course it's up to the the acquisitions committee to make that determination but the curators are the people who are putting the pieces bringing the pieces forward right yeah so that must have um quite a bit of actual influence um throughout the decades on which collections are bigger so if we've got uh, I would imagine that uh, if we're going through a time where resources aren't as scarce and we have a few people um, who are curating for the museum that are all uh, really focused on maybe Southeast Asia, we might wind up with a bigger collection from that area of the world just based on that time frame and, and what we have resources for. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it has to do with uh, areas of uh, knowledge of curators. Um, it also has to do with potentially exhibits that we're working on and pieces that may be coming into the collection because they're required for for an exhibit. Mm -hmm. And we're not loaning, we're not borrowing them from another institution, we're acquiring them for our collection. Uh, but also it, it depends a lot on, on the public and what people have in their families and if they are, they think of us as a, as a suitable home. Right, right. Okay, well, we've got one more question and I think we're gonna wrap there. Um, it's a good one. So this is from an audience member. Um, given Nancy's comment about what could be called redundancy of museum studies and uh, new work environment, are there opportunities for museums personal, uh, personal, personnel being involved in another form of education or connection with the communities that both constitute the communities whose stories effuse with walls of museums and the communities that come to hear the stories uh, 
continued in museum collections. Can, does anybody want to answer that question? I missed, I missed part of that. Okay, um, I'm going to read it. Do you want me to read it again? Read it one more time, but it did trigger one thing before you read it again, which is to say that, uh, thank you, and it's been sent to me. Um, mm -hmm. Given, uh, I just wanted to also say that uh, Nancy's comment about the museum studies course that she took, that course is still offered yeah. here at UVC and uh, currently uh, being taught um, by myself. So yeah. we still have a group of a cohort of students who are actually engaging in, in exhibits in the process. Yeah. So I'll read it one more time and I'll try not to stumble this time. Uh, given Nancy's comment about what could be called redundancy of museum studies in a new work environment, are there opportunities for museum personnel being involved in another form of education or connection with communities that both constitute the communities um, who, whose stories effuse the walls of museums and the communities that come to hear the stories contained in the museum's collections. It's so well written, I feel like it's from a curator. <laughs> it's really hard to express and understand. Um, but yeah, are there new opportunities for us to be teaching in different ways? Like how are we involving community in this process? Can we do a better job of involving indigenous and non-indigenous from this territory communities in this teaching practice with our new medium that we have? We're, I mean, I think one of the, the things about museums is, is first off, we have to own our colonial past and move mm -hmm. towards a different future to where we envision a different future. And that requires working with uh, people from different communities and different backgrounds. Um, and the, one of the things that we do and has happened is a push by MOA for funding to uh, increase community access to collections. So when you talked about the, 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 the traveling of belongings to a potlatch at the request of a family, we actually have managed to, for, for the next few years, I don't know how long it'll go on for, we've managed to find funds that means that there's not a cost to the family for that work. So that we're doing that. So taking on, on board that understanding our obligations and responsibilities. Uh, also bringing people who want to come to the museum here so that they can spend time uh, with the collections and bringing them out. So a lot of handling of the collections by community members. Those are the kinds of new, new ways and things that we're, we're, we're doing and working on so that those are, and, and people are being trained in, in that kind of work as well. Also, uh, one the new way that we MOA just started is a indigenous internship program that uh, involves people right Sue okay. yep yeah we were very fortunate we uh, we received a grant from the museum's assistance program of the Canadian government and the Mellon Foundation in the United States to allow us to uh, run a five-year program to formal program for indigenous interns that of yeah. course has been slightly switched up with 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 COVID and we're looking at a, a slightly different way in the next few months to deliver the next cohort mm -hmm. so so and and, and everybody we're always learning. We're always changing our practice. Museum practice isn't, isn't static. Uh, there's other ways that we're thinking about things too, the acquisitions process, collections, repatriation. These are all ways that we're, we're moving forward. And I might just add in there, like our last year, we do a lot of um, access visits actually to the collection. The last normal year, we did over a hundred and half of those were um, Indigenous BC, either communities or artists or um, individuals who came to um, see the collections in person. And uh, we also, what I didn't really mention about the Reciprocal Research Network is the, the reci reciprocity for that network is that um, if somebody in their home community sees something wrong with the record, or want something added, or they know something about the previous owner um, that they were related to, then they will actually send that information to me and I can add it into the record. So we do have a back and forth that way too. And MOA has a history of and continues to do um, exhibits that are brought to us by um, 
indigenous communities. So for example, The Weaving Behind Me, which is a, was a commission by, uh, from Deborah and Robin Sparrow, um, we recently did an exhibit on, on Salish weaving called Fabric of Our Land, Salish Weaving. And that exhibit um, was brought to us uh, by Wendy Grant John from Musqueam, who said, you're, you're a museum. Uh, the old, beautiful Salish weavings are in collections in Europe and in Eastern North America. Can, re repatriation it is a long-term goal, but you could bring them back now for an exhibit for us. So that's another way that we're, we're changing and, and moving. And from a public programming perspective, um, I'm very happy to be able to do programs online like this because I can reach people around the world and across the country. And we can also access voices from places that we wouldn't have been able to afford to bring in. Um, in the last year, uh, last year, including COVID, um, in the six months prior to COVID, the public programming team brought in a hundred individual artists, all local from many different communities and cultures. And we brought them in. Um, I co-collaborated with all of the different programming from music to dance um, to slam poetry. And uh, we, we give voice and space to communities to come here and say what they need to and uh, discuss issues that are pertinent to the things that we do as well as what happens on the outside world. So um, I think even though COVID has been a really hard time for the entire planet, it is also forcing institutions like this to have a broader voice in a way. So um, we are moving, I think, closer to the type of inclusivity that the world is really demanding of us right now. Yeah, and I think too, we're also looking more and more as a museum, also the ways that we can reach out to um, communities that haven't been able to participate. Museums privilege the visual or have, have privileged the visual. And we've been working with uh, groups, fabulous groups, uh, such as Vocal Eye in Vancouver to look at doing described online tours of exhibits. And those have been very successful programs. Yeah, yeah. So thank you everyone. Um, this was a really great evening. I'm glad you all stuck around for the Q&A and uh, thank you Sue and Nancy and Shabna and Ria for, and everybody else on the um, conservation team for helping us put this together. And um, please everybody tune in next time. Have a good night. Thank you.